In the last video, we talked about becoming a self-blended, friendly classroom. For this video, it's going to be a little bit shorter, but let's talk about the even larger picture. How do you become a self-blended, friendly school? Now, the classroom is much easier because all it really takes is one teacher committed to working with the students in that classroom. And you can start to embrace personal learning networks and building those with the students. You can start to do personalized learning projects that are sort of extensions and different ways of thinking about research projects that have been used for years and years in classrooms. And you can do them in small and, and significant ways for the students. But what if you want to become a self-blended, a self-directed learning school? What does that take? Well, I'm not going to cover all of it in this short video but I have a few remarks to get you thinking and started on this journey. The first thing is a shared mission. If you don't have the leaders and the teachers on board with this, a shared vision for where you're going or a mission, you can wander aimlessly. I often talk about this in the technology world. Educational technology without a compelling mission and vision, a compelling why, is just chasing shiny things. I remember hearing a story once of how you can catch a raccoon. It seems like a cruel kind of trap, and I'm not sure if it actually works. I've been told it does. But essentially, you can take an old log and drill a hole in it, just smaller than the size of a raccoon's fist. And you can take a couple nails and you put them in at an angle on the sides of the hole. And then you take a shiny coin or object and you put it in there, and supposedly, the raccoon will see that shiny object, reach down, grab the coin, and pull out. But it won't let go of the coin. All it has to do to escape is just let go of the coin, and its hand could get out and it could slip out. But without doing that, it's going to be stuck on the nails and it has this coin. And it will just hold on to this shiny thing. But it's kind of lost track of things, right? Which goal is more important, your life or holding on to a shiny coin? Well, the same thing can actually happen in schools as well. If you're just chasing the next shiny trend or innovation, including self-blended and self-directed learning, um, and you don't have a really compelling mission, you don't know what first things are first, you can get trapped and you can get stuck and you'll run into quite a few problems along the way. So the first thing is to have those important conversations with all the key stakeholders all of the teachers and all the administrators. Explore together what is self-directed learning? Why are we doing this? Why does it matter for our students? And make your own list of questions. And don't give up until you have all relentlessly explored and found meaningful answers to those questions and you have a shared vision for what you want to do and why you want to do it. Now you don't have to have everything perfectly figured out. But if you can have that clear mission and you can have some clear values that are going to drive what you do and why you do it, then you're set for some great success and some great opportunities. The next thing is to have a culture of experimentation. So as people are going to do this and they're going to explore it, self-directed learning, every school has to rediscover this to some extent for themselves. There are certainly models where you can take what worked in one school and try to plop it into another school, but usually the culture is a little bit different. The students are different and the other people are different, and so it's going to involve some personalization and some customization for that specific school and context. And everyone is different. So what that means is that people have to be ready for ongoing experimentation. This means monitoring your progress. What's working? What's not working? Why? Creating mechanisms for feedback from parents and from students. Doing it um, daily with students and with teachers and weekly with parents so that you understand what the parents are happy with and what they're not happy with. Because as I mentioned before, they can be one of the greatest supporters of self-blended and self-directed learning and they can also be one of the greatest barriers. After all, it's their kids that we're educating and so they have a, um, an understandable investment in what happens in that school. The next parts, though, once we have those in place, we have to create some space for people to learn and to experiment. I suggest that in a self-directed, self-blended learning environment, it's best done whenever the teachers and the administrators and all the full-time people there are actually engaging in self-directed and self-blended learning themselves, that they're using it for their own professional development, and you're creating communities where people talk about this. They learn to self-direct. So they gain more competence and confidence in helping young people learn to self-direct. 
Another thing we have to do is to create a space for people to share their concerns and their doubts and their questions, but not just let them sit there. Figure out a way to work through them. There are common doubts and questions that will pop up in this initiative. Things can be messy. This can be really uncomfortable, and people need the emotional support and the social support to work through those uncomfortable stages as you work through the difficulty of building a culture of self-directed and self-blended learning. That's really about it. Once you start to build that culture and that community, once you start to work through these things, now you can start to have a school that's committed to self-blended and self-directed learning. Now I say that's about it, but it really is never over. Every day, every week, every month is an opportunity to reimagine and rediscover what this is going to look like in your school.